Welcome back to part two of the Enlightenment lecture. Part one ended abruptly. I had a technical problem, but here we are going to start back with the literature part and finish out this lecture. <clears throat> we were talking about the Enlightenment and the impact of literature on the period. We've got two satirists, Jonathan Swift and Voltaire, that are prevalent during this period. Um, Jonathan Swift is known for his um, Gulliver's Travels. We had novelists. The novel becomes a new genre of writing. Daniel Defoe, Henry Fielding, and Jane Austen are considered some of those early novelists that we see come about in the Enlightenment period. So when we think about um, literature in the Enlightenment, there's a writer, Pope. He was the poet of the Age of Reason. He wrote Essay on Man. It was a philosophical poem explaining humankind's place in the universal scheme. Newspapers and novels both were important pieces of writing during this time period. This is the first time that we see the newspaper come to life. Um, newspapers would have a social criticism that was important in Enlightenment literature. Journalistic essay became a big genre, a big part of literature. Um, and so you had some famous um, newspapers that would publish these journalistic essays, The Spectator, The Tattler, The Guardian. Um, there was an informal prose style that was used so that it would appeal to um, a wider audience of readers, <clears throat> but newspapers and novels. Some famous novels, um, Daniel Defoe wrote Robinson Crusoe. Um, there's this development of the modern novel that's going on. In Robinson Crusoe, we see that sharp realism. It's about a guy that gets stranded on a deserted island, um, and it's just him and uh, another guy that was there kind of as his helper. Um, another type of writing that we see during this period is we're starting to see slave narratives. They're written by African Americans who survived the Middle Passage um, in that part of slavery. We also see travel and travel journals. Travel is a, a, a huge focus during this time period. And so we do see those works that deal with traveling like Robinson Crusoe or Gulliver's Travels. Um, so we start to see a lot of about travel. Now, Jonathan Swift is also known as a satirist. He, um, he and Voltaire, as we mentioned earlier, um, very known for their satire. You have Gulliver's Travels. You have A Modest Proposal, both by Jonathan Swift. You have Candide by Voltaire. Um, the satire is a technological, um, discusses a lot of times technological innovation. The Industrial Revolution gives rise to dangerous working conditions and the exploitation of labor, which these become great topics for a satire. Satire drew attention to this contradiction between those Enlightenment ideals and contemporary realities. You've got the famous Gulliver's Travels, as I've mentioned, from Swift. You've got Candide by Voltaire. And in, Can in Candide, the question is raised, how can evil exist in a universe that's governed by the forces of good? So, again, remember, this is the age of reason. This is the age of thinking. And people are stepping out and speaking out and using their writing as a forum for doing so. Um, Hogarth <clears throat> is known for his visual satires. Um, these were like a visual record of the ills of the 18th century British society. So he would write these satires in visual form. One of uh, Some of the famous ones are The Harlot's Progress, The Rake's Progress, um, and in fact, there's a, a wonderful video link within the PowerPoint where you can actually um, 
see the Rake's progress, the series, the narrative, visual narrative in its uh, the museum where it's located. Uh, the marriage transaction. This was a caricature, a comic irony of with symbolic details. So we're starting to see that infusion of not only writing but also art to create this visual satire. Now, the Rake's Progress is a series of eight different prints. They're produced in 1735, and they depict the fall of Tom Rakewell, the son of a rich merchant who comes to London and spends all of his money on gambling and prostitution. He becomes imprisoned, and he ends up in a mental asylum. So, a nice little happy story for you. All right, so when we're talking about visual arts in the Enlightenment, we've got a famous style that we need to talk about. It's called the Rococo style. This style is characterized by elaborate ornamentation, asymmetrical values, pastel color palette, curved or serpentine lines. Um, Rococo artwork usually depicts themes of love and classical myths, youth, and place playfulness. Um, you remember we talked about these same sorts of things in the Baroque period, that a lot of ornamental value, a lot of extra. Well, this takes that idea and it takes it a little further in some areas, but softens it um, in others. And this is thought of as the decorative finale of the Baroque era. So you see some examples in the pictures of some architecture, you see the pastel colors we mentioned, but also very ornate gold. Um, here you've got red with the gold. Um, and we would also see the Rococo si um, style in gardens. There would be gardens. The, um, this one on the right, this is a, a Japanese garden, but it was in a Rococo style. And so you've got again, you know, this, this very ornate boundary for this pond, right? Um, and it's very extra, if you will. And it's also got that curved line to it. Um, the a famous palace, uh, the Salon de la Princesse, um, you can see in these pictures. This is the Church of Otto Buren in Bavaria. And this was designed by Johann Michael Fischer. Fischer's greatest work is generally considered to be the Benedictine Abbey Church at Otto Buren. This is a vast Rococo structure that's centered on three successive cupolas and lavishly but elegantly decorated with sculpture, stucco work, and paint. So when you're trying to see the difference between Baroque and Rococo, one thing I like to think of is the use of pastels for starts, but also it's a little more elegant. It is a lot less um, over the top. You know, the gold doesn't overpower the elegance that you see. It's a little more refined, a little more subtle, um, a little bit more, you know, elegant and beautiful. It's still lavish. Um, still extravagant, but it's it's more elegantly done. It's got a little more class, if you will. So here you can see the outside of the church um, or the abbey. Look inside, okay? Remember our Greco and Roman, especially the Roman, where we'd have the apse, we'd have a center aisle, we'd have this area off to the side, and it would be broken up from the center aisle with columns. So we're still seeing some of this in architecture. But look at the beautiful, beautiful frescoes um, in the ceiling. You see um, the use of pastel colors in these little small semicircular or dome, uh, partial dome shapes. Um, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful paintings incorporated in this um, architectural design. Uh, these structures would have um, sculptures, they would have stucco work, they would um, have paint. You know, even the outside has some of these pastel colors. So, very pretty. Painting. There's a Rococo style in painting. 
It focused on the aristocracy and courtly upper class. It favored an intimate boudoir style with an emphasis on finesse and artificiality, um, which it, this becomes a very big specialty in France, this Rococo style. Notice in these paintings, they have a, a kind of an artificial. They don't seem real. There's, there's kind of a... a uh, a haze to it, like it's like it's um, imagined. All right. Some famous French painters from this period: Jean Antoine Watteau, Francois Boucher, and Jean Henri Fragonard. And we're going to take a look at some of their things. So, when you look at the Rococo painting, there seems to be this pursuit of pleasure as being a theme of many of these Rococo paintings. So. It's going to be fun. It's going to be playful. It's going to be pleasurable. Um, a famous one by Watteau is the departure from the island of Cythera. Um, and we'll take a look at some of these in a second. Francois Boucher, a friend of Madame de Pompadour, and he influenced fashion and arts at Versailles. Remember King Louis XIV and his elaborate palace, Versailles. Well, Francois Boucher um, was friends with the Madame de Pompadour who influenced fashion and art at that palace. Uh, one of his famous works among so many is The Bath of Venus. Um, it's an erotic female nude, and it was a favorite of Rococo subjects. Um, let's take a look at some of these. All right, so here are some from Jean-Henri Fragonard. Here's Young Girl Reading. All right, here's music lesson. So you notice the, the young woman is having a music lesson. Notice the little cat. I think that's a cat. This one's called the happy lovers. So you see them, you know, um, in a nice little embrace, enjoying the weather and each other. So you see that Rococo style, playful, um, almost not super realistic. Everything's more... Uh, muted and more soft, a lot of softness, no harsh, just kind of blended and fun and playful and happy, contented, you know, you see in this young girl. Francois Boucher, this one's called The Love Letter. Now, you're going to see nudity um, in some Rococo style, because remember, you know, the Again, there was a focus on love and playfulness and, and sometimes the erotic. So here you have um, the love letter. And so you've got the woman. You see the, the, the like Cupid here, right? Because you see the little arrows, another little cherub, little chubby cherub over here. This one's called Sleeping Shepherd. Um, again, remember there was a focus on nature too, right? And during this time period. So a lot of these you'll see out in nature. And this, uh, this one is not the Bath of Venus. All right. We'll have to find one of those. That is definitely not the Bath of Venus. All right. In England, painting was important as well. And some famous English painters were Sir Joshua Reynolds, Thomas Gainsborough, and like all of Northern Europe, 18th century England was greatly interested in the portraiture, that portrait of someone. And so here from Sir Joshua Reynolds, you see this portrait. You've got the woman, you've got the lambs, right? Almost like that Mary and her little lambs idea. Thomas Gainsborough is a very famous painter. Um, he was known for his portraits, and these are two of his famous ones. Um, this one on the right is called um, Blue Boy, um, and then this one's Lady in Pink, or Pink Lady. Um, very famous. In fact, my mom had this one on the right, a print of that one that hung in the house the whole time I was growing up. And I have it now, and it's in uh, my outer building office, but um, very very big into portraiture. Now notice how in both of these there is that landscape scene behind. It's not just, you know, a solid background. There's an interesting scene happening behind the picture that adds um, to the picture and the importance of that person. All right, some other um, 
Here's another picture or another painting, I'm sorry, by Fragonard. This is the swing. Now, what's interesting is you see the woman swinging, and then you've got this guy over here that's pushing her, but then you've got the creeper that's in the bushes looking up her skirt while she's swinging, okay? Um, this is Marie Antoinette. This is a, you know, famous person in French history, let them eat cake. Um, and you see this painting, this portrait or rendition of her by Vigie Lebrun. Um, very self-conscious materialism, okay? So there's a lot of emphasis on the, um, her hat, okay? Very materialistic. Um, her dress, which costs tons of money while the peasants are revolting on the street, right? So um, he did spend a lot of time focusing on that self-conscious materialism. Now, in the Rococo sculpture, again, usually the subjects were very lighthearted. So in this one, you've got, by Clodian, a famous sculptor, the intoxication of wine. And so here you see, you know, this like, um, this is uh, kind of like the god of wine and, you know, one of the goddesses. And, and you see this, you know, intoxication of wine, their bodies intertwined. And you can see this from different angles and um, just, you know, very playful, very lighthearted. There was genre painting that became a thing. And so enlightened critics attacked the Rococo style as frivolous. Um, and so because of that opinion um, by some that Rococo was frivolous, then others came out and uh, were painting serious scenes or important scenes from society. So Gruz um, specialized in realistic scenes of everyday life. For example, the village bride, okay? So this is a young woman and she's at the age where it's time for her to be married. And so you've got people vying for her hand. She is the village bride. And this one by Chardin, this is the kitchen maid. And so you see her life is very different maybe from someone in this situation. Um, she's paused during this daily task um, to kind of look off into space, right, and take a little break. Music becomes an important, important thing during this period. This is when classical symphony shows up, and orchestra, sonata form, Haydn and Mozart, two famous composers um, in the history of symphony. So, there's a rise of music for the secular entertainment. Gone are the sacred, music just being about sacred, about, you know, church services. Now they're writing music for everyone else and for the regular secular population's entertainment. The 18th century gave rise to distinct Western musical characteristics. Harmony is that proper and becomes proper and essential to music. There's musical composition and the idea that it should be an original product of a single composer. No longer are they just copying from something else or from something um, religion-centered. Um, the pieces should be rehearsed and performed in the same way each time. So, you know, having this music, reading this music, performing this music. There also was an order and formality that would characterize classical music. Um, so all of these things come about during this period. 18th century classical music prevailed in the West between 1760 and 1820. There was symmetry, there was balance, there was formal restraint. Um, there was developed a unique model for clarity of form and purity of design. There was written for variety, it was written for a variety of different instrumental groupings. So you'd have symphony and concerto and a string quartet and sonata. So there, music's expanding. Um, and classical music especially is expanding during this time period. We've come a long way from the Gregorian chant. All genres had the same formal structure. There were three or four movements. Each followed a specific tempo. 
The first was Allegro, second was Andante or Largo, the second was Dance Tempo, and the fourth was Allegro. And the sonata form is created. There was theme and variation, basic musical idea repeated in various ways. Um, so we started to see um, the theme, the tonality, and so you see there'd be the first theme, then a bridge, a second theme. That's part of the exposition. Meanwhile, tonally, there's a home key up to second key. Then the development of the piece, there'd be first and second themes developed. You'd have contrasting keys going on. And then the recapitalization, or capitulate, I can't say it today, recapitulation, the first theme, a bridge, the second theme, okay, and back to home key. So music began to have a form in the classical music and um, the all the creations from that, um, the composition of it, the creating of taking that classical music and creating a symphony or what have you. It's starting to really leap off the page. You get the birth of the symphony orchestra, groups of related instruments, each with their own character or personality, strings and woodwinds and brass and percussion. Remember back when we just had like just two kind of instruments, right? One that looked like a tuba and one that looked like a trumpet or trombone. A famous composer, Haydn, is considered the father of the symphony. He writes 104 symphonies, 84 string quartets. Um, in London, he writes 12 symphonies in which he expands harmonic range, giving it a very dramatic effect. The symphony number no. 94 in G major um, called The Surprise. Now, look at all the different in instruments. You've got flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, trumpets, trombones, French horns, um, violas, double basses, cellos, the timpani, second violins, first violins, and the clavier. We've come a long way. Mozart, another famous composer. He was a child prodigy. He wrote his first composition at six. He had unparalleled melodic inventiveness. He wrote symphonies number 39, 40, and 41, which are considered landmarks in classical symphonic form. He wrote four of the most loved Western operas, The Marriage of Figaro, Don Giovanni, Thus Do All Women, and a really famous one, The Magic Flute. So when we're looking at landmarks and legacies of the Enlightenment, Remembering that enlightenment is a process. People didn't just wake up one day enlightened. It was a process. It was a process that the entire um, society was going through. Remember that enlightenment was a turning point in Western history. It provided foundations for modern science and a variety of disciplines that applied real reason to social, economic, and political life. It elevated our reason over just religion. Now, every, religion didn't dictate everything. Now people could think outside of their religious beliefs. There were literary contributions, the satire, the encyclopedia, the newspaper, the modern novel. In visual arts, we had the Rococo style that celebrated the world of the aristocracy, um, which of course gave way to neoclassicism. We also saw an emphasis on order and formalism in performing arts. We saw new instrumental forms. We saw the birth of symphony orchestra, the compositions of Mozart and Haydn. So even though we think of the Enlightenment sometimes as being that scientific and thinking time, it was also a big creative time. And in so many ways, people were thinking about what they were creating. So that's why we get so many interesting um, innovations in art forms as well. This concludes our lecture on the Enlightenment. Thank you for joining me. Um, and we're getting so close to the end, folks. So close. Just a couple more chapters remain. I'll talk to you soon.